gathered quick scent. So, Kevin called me like at 5 a.m. this morning. He thinks Craig broke um, the Z340. That's crazy. I mean, do we call the FBI? No, I think the first thing we gotta do is try your test and make sure it holds up. All right. But this turns out to be true, that's, that's insane. They might have f***ing done it. Of all the things, they might have f***ing done it. Like, so, yeah. Give him a shout, you know. I mean, there's nothing to do except keep moving forward, so. I'm dreaming about these cases like I was at the crime scene. Yeah. A year into the investigation, and the trail of evidence has taken detectives Sal La Barbera and Ken Maines well beyond the Zodiac's official killing zone. Right here, Sherry Jo Bates' body was found. From a brutal stabbing in Riverside, California in 1966. 120 degrees south, we'll be at the burial site. To a missing persons case on the border of Nevada in 1970. He says, I'm going to start killing again and 3,000 miles away to Albany, New York, where in 1973, the Zodiac threatened to strike again. We have to get creative. We really have to dig. Throughout their investigation, one trend remains. Their two prime suspects, ex-librarian Ross Sullivan and career criminal Lawrence Kane, line up with the evidence in uncanny ways. Sullivan fits the physical description of the Zodiac, wore army boots similar to the ones found at Zodiac's crime scenes, and studied cryptography, writing a detailed paper on creating complex codes. But perhaps most compelling, Sullivan grew up near where the Zodiac threatened to kill in Albany, New York, then moved to Riverside, California, prior to the Sherry Joe Bates murder. He worked at the last place that Sherry Jo Bates was seen alive, at the library. His next move was to Northern California, just months before the confirmed Zodiac killings began in that area. Evidence against Lawrence Kane is just as compelling. He was identified by a victim as the Zodiac killer, was unaccounted for during the Zodiac crimes, including the 1966 Riverside murder. He worked down the hall from the Lake Tahoe victim and was arrested in Albany, New York. Kane also studied codes during his time in the Navy and was reportedly spotted trawling for new victims near one of the crime scenes, asking young women what their Zodiac sign is. These are the strongest connections anyone has made to a Zodiac suspect in decades. But ultimately, who is the killer? If there's anything that would strengthen our suspects, you know, Kane or Sullivan, San Francisco is the place to find it. This is our jump off point. All four of the confirmed Zodiac cases have occurred in Northern California. We can place our suspects, Ross Sullivan and Lawrence Kane, both of them in Northern California. This is the epicenter of the entire investigation. I grouped together ones that kind of look like circles. 400 miles south, Code team leader Kevin Knight takes a private meeting at his USC office with NSA fellow Craig Bauer. He intentionally incorporated some variants in this. Mm -hmm. Late last night, Craig placed a call to Kevin. I've cracked the Z340 site. If you got it here, this is the biggest thing in cryptography for decades. When the Zodiac Killer mailed the Z340 to the San Francisco Chronicle in November 1969, he hinted that his name was hidden in the bizarre code. But all previous attempts to solve it have failed. Now, Kevin wants to understand the methods and tactics Craig used to break the Zodiac's unbreakable code. When I look back closer at the Zodiac's first cipher, the 408 cipher, and just trying to get psychologically in the killer's head, I was able to unravel this. In August 1969, the Zodiac sent out his first cipher, the 408, 
which was broken just weeks later. Then in November, he released his crown jewel, the Z340, potentially building on his previous cipher system to make a much harder code to break. I looked back at that earlier cipher, and in that cipher, only one letter was in ciphers itself, the letter E. And that was broken. So maybe as an amateur, to make things harder, you go to the other direction and have several letters enciphered as themselves. Ultimately, in the solution I found, there were 13 letters that represented themselves. Half the alphabet just goes to itself. And this is something most professionals aren't going to consider. They think it was ridiculous. This is why it hasn't been solved. So there's this idea of hiding in plain sight, which sounds absolutely ridiculous, but often works. He hid half the letters behind themselves. You'd never think to look behind an H and find an H. So I feel like that was a breakthrough insight, because you know, then I, I look just at the first line. We have backwards K, I, something L. I mean, what would that be if you're? It looks like kill, right? Kill, yeah. So I, I filled that in. So uh, that was a huge help to fill those letters in elsewhere. And then I was essentially off and running. So my solution goes great through eight lines. And then all of a sudden, line nine, it was gibberish, gibberish, gibberish. Craig believes the first eight lines of the Z340 contain the majority of the code while lines 9 through 18 are meaningless symbols. Could this have been another cunning trick by the Zodiac that outsmarted code breakers and supercomputers? I think that's why computer attacks haven't worked up to this point. No. If you're on a computer program on a whole thing when approximately half of it is gibberish, you know, all of your stats are thrown off. This is a wonderful explanation for why the 340 was not broken by Carmel or anybody else who attacked it with a sophisticated computer system. So I got a bunch of gibberish, a bunch of gibberish. But then I got down farther, and something really interesting happened. This is the name. Wow. The Zodiac taunted that his name was locked within the bizarre symbols of his Z340 cipher. Could the name Craig uncovered finally reveal the killer's identity after more than half a century? At first glance, that looks great. Uh, you know, unbelievable, because so many people have worked on it. This could be uh, an incredibly important development. But we have to be careful with this until we're 100% sure this is the solution. We're dealing with real victims, real suspects, and it would be irresponsible to release this to the public until we've gone line by line and verified it as correct. Then we need to take it right to the authorities. Hello, the cell. Hey, Sal, this is Kevin. I got some potentially big news. So I met with Craig Bauer. He claims he saw the Z340 cipher. Really? I mean, that's tremendous. So did you get the Zodiac's name? Uh, we're not sure. Uh, we really got to dissect it some more before we share anything. Keep us updated, OK, buddy? We'll do it. person like Zodiac could have blended in to a big city like this. Sal and Ken will begin their San Francisco investigation by focusing on the brutal slaying of cab driver Paul Stein in October 1969. This is the last confirmed Zodiac murder and the only crime scene where he left behind significant evidence. There was a fingerprint that was left in blood on the cab. That's important. A nine millimeter weapon was used. So they got casings and bullets from that. Could the killer's mistakes here be the key to finally linking him to one of their prime suspects? We could take that evidence and compare it to our cases. Now we really have a, another jump off point. Sal and Ken have gotten an exclusive meeting with retired San Francisco police detective Tom Bruton, who worked the Paul Stein murder for over six years. This is the first time Bruton has talked publicly about the case since his retirement in 2003. It was Saturday night, October 11th, 1969, about 9.40 at night. Paul Stein is a grad student driving yellow cab at night to make some money. Picks up a fare. According to his log, uh, the fare wanted to be dropped 
at uh, Washington and Laurel Street. He ended up dropping him a few blocks further down uh, Washington at Cherry Street. He stops the cab, appears the suspect stuck a 9 millimeter into his right temple and shot him in the head. Moments after the slaying, three teenagers having a party across the street looked out their second story window to see the Zodiac cleaning up the crime scene. Their description resulted in this now famous composite drawing. According to witnesses, the suspect then gets out of the cab, opens up the driver's door, and starts doing something to the driver. Turns out he was uh, ripping off a piece of his shirt and also taking his wallet and the car keys. The crime scene's biggest mystery, a pair of size seven male gloves found in the back seat of the cab. To this day, the origin of these gloves is unknown. It was unclear who, if anybody, owned them. Could have been left by a previous passenger. Absolutely. We had no idea this was a Zodiac case until two days later. The Chronicle receives a letter. This is the Zodiac. And included with that letter was a piece of Paul Stein's shirt. You know, it's 50 years later, and there's still so much we don't know about the case. Is there any leads? that you think we should follow up on? There was an inspector in the homicide detail who uh, was involved with the investigation, and especially the DNA aspect of it. Pam Hofsis is her name, so she'd be a good contact for you. In addition to connecting Sal and Ken with Pam Hofsis, who is believed to have access to never-before-seen DNA evidence, Detective Bruton shares the original Paul Stein police reports, which have been closely guarded by the San Francisco Police Department. I mean, having these documents in hand, very few people have ever seen this. Got a police report. Well, that's money, partner. Could new DNA evidence and new police files be the key to finally unraveling the case? Let's go. Craig shared it with me. I took a look at it but we want to know what the whole group thinks about it. Kevin Knight and the code team have gathered to undertake a crucial task, examining Craig's stunning solution to the Zodiac Killer Z340 cipher, one of the top three unbroken ciphers in the world. If the solution is correct, it could provide critical clues in revealing the killer's identity. Peer review is very important when you've got a potential breakthrough like this. If someone said they had a cure for cancer, run it by their colleagues first before announcing it to the world. So we need to go line by line and make sure this thing is solid. And if it is, take it immediately for outside verification as well as to law enforcement. So the big picture was trying to get into the killer's head. Kind of in the mind of an amateur, I got an idea. Maybe letters could represent themselves. Interesting. Yeah. And you know, once you have that idea, words can pop. For the first time, a line-by-line -line solution to one of the world's most unbreakable codes. So here's the first part of the solution. I saw the beginning, H-E-R, and it just came to me. Here it is as the beginning. To me, this sounded like Zodiac. I agree. So much so, I came upon this. It is a killer from the 1940s, the Black Dahlia Avenger. It's a letter he wrote that begins, here it is. The Black Dahlia is the infamous nickname for the brutal 1947 unsolved murder of actress Elizabeth Short in Los Angeles, California. After leaving the victim's mutilated body in a vacant lot, the Black Dahlia killer sent mocking letters to police, beginning with, here it is. That can't be by just coincidence. Uh, I imagine that he enjoyed reading about killers, maybe older cases he could read about in true detective type magazines. Zodiac was definitely influenced with, you know, the culture and what was going on at the time. A lot of what he got comes from detective magazines, comes from comic books, comes from movies. So I think Black Dahlia could have been possible sources of inspiration for Zodiac. Something inspired him to write letters and here are phrases lifted from it. 
That's really cool. Now here, on the next line, this is a little bit scary, okay? I kill both night and day. Wow. Incredible. So I see this phrase, and I had to check dates, because I remembered, of course, this murder, the first daytime attack that Zodiac made, Lake Berryessa. In September 1969, the Zodiac killer attacked a young couple in Lake Berryessa, California, binding them with rope and then stabbing them 16 times with a foot-long knife. This marked the first time the killer struck during broad daylight. Six weeks later, the Zodiac sent his infamous Z340 cipher. So in November, when he's saying, I kill both night and day, I mean, it's a true statement. Oh, wow. Quite interesting. And I, I think this was important to him, to strike fear into more people. I mean, maybe he's figuring, oh, you know, so people think they're safe if they just go out during the day. And then by having a daytime attack, you're never safe. It has that taunting tone that we come to expect from the Zodiac's writings and letters. So far, so good. Seems like it's working. Craig's solution, it, you know, it's the best one that we've seen. You can't fake the voice of the Zodiac. And the more we're digging into this, the more it sounds exactly like him. I mean, what are you thinking about this, Ken? I mean, what I'm looking for, Sal, and my suspect is somebody that was in the AV club. You know, that type of person. Sal and Ken pour through their exclusive police reports in search of any evidence that could link the Zodiac Killer to one of their prime suspects. Just found an article from 1966 where Ross Sullivan was making a movie about a killer. It was so real that the police were called. That's the year Sherry Joe Bates was killed. There's a picture of Ross Sullivan here. Producers were enacting a convincing murder. Murder scene. Ross Sullivan played a killer. That's crazy. I mean, regardless of what the police were called about, I mean, it shows that Ross Sullivan was making movies. That is the complete unknown of Ross Sullivan. We the never knew that. Of yeah, the Sullivan exactly. that we know. That lines up with what we're looking at now, right? Every investigator that has worked on the Zodiac case has become a part of his game, but I'm getting close to where I look at the whole Zodiac mystery and say, checkmate, I got you. I think we're that close. Sal and Ken are investigating the Zodiac Killer's 1969 slang of cab driver Paul Stein. What I really am interested in is DNA. Oh, wow. Witnesses are dead. People's minds are forgotten. DNA does not go away. They've made a critical breakthrough. This way. Securing a meeting with Pam Hofsess. She worked for the San Francisco Police Department from 1989 to 2015 where she was assigned the Zodiac case and has intimate knowledge of never before seen DNA evidence. Hi, Pam. Hey, Pam has never spoken publicly about her work on the Zodiac case. When I inherited the case, having come from DNA, right, from the lab, I'm all about the evidence. That's I'm right. like, okay, well, let's look at what we have. What is the status of the evidence? In 2002, Authorities used saliva from a stamp on the envelope that the Zodiac killer used to mail his Z340 cipher to extract a DNA profile of the killer. This profile is the only source of Zodiac DNA used by police, despite it being weak and incomplete. But Pam was determined to find a better way to forensically identify the killer. I started looking at some of the evidence from the Paul Stein shooting that had been uh, literally in, the, in a bag, envelope, or box on the shelf for years. And uh, lo and behold, there was a pair of bloody gloves that were found in the, at the scene. We didn't know who the gloves belonged to or what the connection is. 
For decades, rumors have swirled around the source of these gloves, found in the back seat of Paul Stein's cab. Were they left behind by Stein? Another passenger? The Zodiac Killer? For nearly 50 years, no one outside the San Francisco Police Department has known the secrets this piece of evidence could hold. Those gloves, they appeared to be moldy. There was some blood on the, on the outside of the gloves. Now my mind is going into DNA. The glove DNA report confirmed that it's Paul Stein's blood on the outside. And then there's an unknown male profile on the inside. I mean, potentially, that's Zodiac's DNA. Yes, and that is key. Pam may have a DNA profile of the Zodiac killer. We could finally figure out who Zodiac was through unimpeachable forensic evidence. But to do this, we would need to test this DNA against the DNA from one or both of our suspects. Earlier in the investigation, the team was able to isolate DNA from the 1966 Riverside murder that could belong to the Zodiac killer. Look at that, Sal, right there. It very well could be the suspect's blood. If their state-of-the-art DNA lab can extract a viable male profile from that blood stain, they could finally answer the ultimate question in this case. If we could get DNA evidence from the Riverside case and compare them to what you found inside of the glove from Paul Stein's cab, we could determine if it was Zodiac. Yes, absolutely. So let's compare them. We know where Paul Stein ends up. Uh, Washington and Cherry. But that doesn't tell us anything. Let me see something here. At approximately 9.55 right. is when the homicide occurred. The meter read 217. Can we work this backwards to find out where Stein picked up Zodiac. And if we do that, At least we may area. be able to tell who of our suspects are in that area, right? We have to look at 1969, cab fares, San Francisco City. Let me take a look at that police report while you're doing that. All right, Sal, write this stuff down. Cab fare in San Francisco, 1969. 55 cents for the first one-fifth mile, 10 cents for each additional one-fifth mile. So we have $2.17 to work with. We know it's 55 cents as soon as you get in the car. Yes, so subtract 55 cents from $2.17. $1.62. Now we're at $1.62, which should be traveling. Yes. That's 3.2 miles. 3.2 miles backtracked from Washington and Cherry. It was Union Square. It's an ad area. Market District, Tenderloin. I mean, theater district. Theater district. The arts played a significant role for the Zodiac Killer. He often referenced plays, films, and operas in his letters. Factoring in streets and turns, San Francisco's theater district is about three miles from the Paul Stein crime scene. Could this be where the Zodiac Killer got in Paul Stein's cab? And could there be a link to prime suspect Ross Sullivan, an actor with a keen interest in film and theater? Hey, take a look at this. Lawrence Kane has had so many addresses, so many aliases. I mean, he had a vehicle that he sold. I mean, this was in July 1969. When he did the, tra the car transfer, it's 217 Eddy, E-D-D-Y Street. In San Francisco? In San Francisco. And it was in July of 69, which is three months before these murders. Right. The distance between the crime scene and where Lawrence Kane lived at 217 Eddy Street is 3.3 miles. The exact distance within one-tenth of a mile. 
Lawrence Kane lived just two blocks from where Paul Stein could have picked up the Zodiac Killer. And his house is smack dab in the middle of the theater district. That's not a coincidence. The language is interesting, right? I mean, definitely seems like Zodiac speak. But that's a positive it's a plus, thing. right? Yeah, definitely. Kevin Knight and the code team are examining Craig Bauer's solution to the Zodiac Killer Z340 cipher, one of the top three unbroken codes in the world. If his solution is correct, it could provide crucial clues that reveal the identity of one of the most infamous killers in history. So it's here it is, I kill both night and day. So far, the first two lines have checked out. Now they continue with the rest of the solution. So uh, next we have, I live by the gun barrel, aim. I live by the gun. To me, that sounds a lot like Zodiac. Uh, we have the phrase, of course, by gun used in this. Less than a year after the Zodiac killer sent out his Z340 cipher, he mailed a taunting Halloween card to the press using the identical phrase, by gun. On the next line, we have the phrase, so quit wishing for game to be over, pig. And you know, he talked about the game repeatedly. And he continues, is my wrist in locks? I took that to mean, am I arrested? Am I in handcuffs? Am I locked up? Like, no, like the game's going on. I do think that's a clever way of saying that. You know, definitely. Now angry, dangerous. Dangerous is misspelled, but it's clearly recognizable. Dangerous is a word that he misspelled in a previous letter. Really? Wow. In the Zodiac Killer's only solved cipher, the Z408, he also misspelled the same exact word, dangerous. This guy had frequent typos, you know? I mean, so then you, you already have errors and you write it in English and you convert it into a cipher. It's only gonna make it worse, right? I mean, this is a guy who was known for making mistakes. In some of his letters, just in plain old English, he had 10% of the words misspelled. So if you start off with something that's already riddled with errors and then you encipher it, you get a solution riddled with even more errors. It matches the language. It reuses some of the words that we saw, like game, which is kind of consistent with the Zodiac speak that we all expect. It's definitely interesting. You know, I think Craig's solution, Craig's key is compelling. Is it worth going outside this room and getting another opinion? Hundreds of people have tried to solve the Z340 over a period of 50 years. But no matter what they've tried, it's all failed. So before we reveal the name at the bottom of the solution, we have to take it to Carnegie Mellon University. They're the best experts in the academic world on the Z340. And then if they give it the thumbs up, we need to take it to the CIA. You gotta feel what he felt. What did he do in 1969? 400 miles north, Sal and Ken have discovered that during the 1969 slaying of cab driver Paul Stein, the Zodiac Killer may have gotten into Stein's cab in the theater district, just blocks from the home of their prime suspect, Lawrence Kane. I think it's gonna be over here. They've set up a meeting with Roger Pearson, who has worked with the Lamplighter Theater Troupe at the Orpheum Theater since the 1960s, located two blocks from Kane's residence. I understand that you were here in the 1960s? In 69, uh, the Lamplighters had their first show here in 1968. The Lamplighters Musical Theater is devoted to keeping the Gilbert and Sullivan tradition alive, and they wrote satirical musicals. They did um, the HMS Pinafore, they did a spoof on the, uh, the Queen's Navy, and then we uh, did the Mikado in 1969. We did the Mikado play here, actually, in 1969. Yes, we did. The Mikado is an opera set in Japan with a main character named the Executioner, who the Zodiac quoted in his letters. Do you remember 
Was the Mikado playing on the night Paul Stein was murdered? Oh, yes. I was a part of that production. Wow. I remember it quite clearly. Hmm. Unbelievable. The thing is, Zodiac happened to write a letter which, word for word, quoted the Mikado. Would that tell you anything about that guy? Well, if the Zodiac lived around here, you would definitely know about Mikado and the Lamplighters. And since our audience were repeat, I firmly believe without a doubt, he probably at some point in time was in the audience, not only once, several times, I'm sure. We as performers always had a meet and greet. And so we get to see the people that have come to the show again. You get to know them by name and recognize them. And um, in fact, afterwards, when we're like getting through with the meet and greet and we're taking off our costumes, somebody would say, did you see that weirdo? From the audience? Yeah. Well, tell me about some of that. Yeah, we used to have this one guy that would come and um, he would have a different costume on all the time. And his, his favorite costume seemed to be leather. It kind of gave the girls the willies. Do you remember anything about him, his physical description? I, I remember he was a big guy. He probably was over six foot. And he was well built. Well built. <laughs> yeah, stocky, okay. I would say. I mean, this is amazing. Roger's description of the audience member matches that of the Zodiac. And you add to that that the Mikado was playing on the same evening that Paul Stein was murdered. And even though Lawrence Kane lived within two blocks of the theater where Paul Stein may have picked up the killer, Lawrence Kane wasn't a big, tall guy. He was shorter. But someone who does fit that description perfectly is our other suspect, Ross Sullivan. We're gonna catch the son of a gun, because he left his DNA there. Absolutely. Right now, we have two great suspects, Lawrence Kane and Ross Sullivan, for the most notorious serial murder case in US history. In my experience, it's rare to have two suspects this late into the investigation. Both line up with the evidence in so many ways. There is so much that stack up on both of these suspects. Ton of circumstantial evidence. Yeah, but we need that direct evidence. Let's roll. Hello? Hey, it's Susanna Ryan. Susanna, what's up? We got the DNA report back. So I wanted to give you a call and let you know okay. what the results were for the case. So, this is our pants. For months, Sal and Ken have been waiting for DNA results from the 1966 Riverside murder of Sherry Jo Bates, a crime the Zodiac took credit for. Although the pants were covered in the victim's blood, the team discovered a new blood stain, possibly left by the killer. Give us some good news. OK, so I was not sure we were going to get anything just because of the age of the samples. But actually, they were able to get some DNA results. The bottom of the Capri pants, one, it's a mixture, but there is some male DNA present. Wow. In that particular sample. Wow. Yes. That's great, great, great. For the first time in history, a male DNA profile has been retrieved from Sherry Jo Bates's pants, which they believe belongs to the killer. If we had a profile or a sample to compare, is there enough there? Sure. Awesome. Yes. OK. Yes. I mean, this is great. We can compare this against the DNA recovered from the gloves in Paul Stein's taxi. Yes, yeah, get wow. his DNA, we can compare him to all those cases. The code team are pursuing a breakthrough of their own. Confirmation that Craig Bauer has done the impossible and cracked the Zodiac Z340, the holy grail of unsolved ciphers. Taylor Berg Kilpatrick is a professor of artificial intelligence and considered one of the world's best academic minds on the Z340. With his endorsement, the solution could be taken to the intelligence community or law enforcement, providing one of the most important new pieces of evidence in the Zodiac case in more than 50 years. 
so only recently now we've got something that's uh, where we feel we want to take it outside and get some. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, other opinions on. Like you think you have a solution? Yes. And that's what we want to. Is that why I'm here? Right that's why you're here, right? Okay. Let's see this. It begins. Here it is. I kill both night and day. Period. Mm -hmm. I live by the gun, barrel, aim. So quit wishing for game to be over, pig. Is my wrist in locks? Now angry, dangerous, period. I won't change any of game. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so far I see exactly what you're describing. Lots of characters are placed with themselves. But then when you would see a pattern like the E and then another character and another E, then he switches it up. How many people have seen this? <laughs> like, I feel like, like this is convincing to me. Yeah. Big time. <laughs> and I feel like I'm witnessing something that so many people have wanted to know the answer to for so long, and finally now we're seeing it. It feels like looking at like an artwork or something. This is crazy. <laughs> and then after eight meaningful lines, he did something that would throw off most people. He has a bunch of gibberish. So I tried these substitutions. It's just gibberish, gibberish, gibberish. He's just messing with us. Mm. Okay, but look at what happens at the mm. end. We got a name of somebody who fits the time period. What name does that look like? Richard Nixon? He's messing with us. Wait, 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 wait. How do we know that this second half is gibberish? It could be that whatever happens right after your key stops working, yes. the cipher enters a different mode. And what happens in the second half is a whole different kind of cipher. It could have who knows what. Like, potentially, it could have his name in it. I think there's been lots and lots of proposed solutions to 340 over the years, and I think it's difficult to get law enforcement to pay attention to one and, unless it has some external validation. Craig and Kevin have had their solution of the Z340 cipher confirmed by an academic expert. This is convincing to me. Yeah. <laughs> Big time. Now, the final hurdle will be bringing the solution to one of the most respected members of the intelligence community. Ed Scheidt is the former chairman of the CIA's cryptographic center. If he confirms Craig's solution, it will become unparalleled new evidence for law enforcement. For nearly 50 years, people have chased after a solution to this Zodiac cipher. And now we have a moment of truth. So it's an exciting moment, an exciting test. How will the judge rule? There's no way to be sure. We got to go in that room and hear the judgment. We're asking kind of for an evaluation, taking into account all the factors What's your basic assessment? Well, I, I think you have a logical explanation for what you're doing, as well as you also were able to fold in uh, the contextual side of it. And uh, what we have here, I think this is uh, a very good answer. And, you know, I just say, you know, congratulations. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me to have confirmation from someone of your stature. You did good. <laughs> In the intelligence community, you break a cipher, but that's just the beginning. The next step is what actionable intelligence does this decrypt give us? So it's very exciting to see where this goes from here. From what is gleaned out of this, we may be able to discover something more about the person. The ultimate would be who the person was. Yes. I mean, to have another piece of writing in such a cold case connected with the killer, it's a clue, you know? I mean, sometimes these things unravel from the flimsiest of clues. No, that's true. Well, this is not flimsy. <laughs> the best people to look at it from this point would be the experts at the FBI. 
maybe there's something in their files that they can connect this with. So that's very exciting to get it into their hands. What's going on, Kevin? Calling about the Z340. We had a uh, good meeting with the external expert, and uh, he liked it. <laughs> so the Craig, basically, congratulations. Wow, all right. Well, that's great news. Congratulations, man. But he also thinks that there may be another cipher within the cipher that Craig's solution doesn't cover. So he thinks there's more to it. Unbelievable. What's your plan with that? Uh, there's just more to do. Exactly. I mean, I'm not going to lie. This is one of those cases that keeps me up at night. And it's because we're so damn close to solving it. Closer than anyone's been in 50 years. I mean, we have three new crimes that have undeniable links to Zodiac. If this is Zodiac, it is monumental. We found a whole new Zodiac letter in Albany, New York. There is no doubt in my mind is the Zodiac writing. We have brand new DNA evidence. Look at that, blood. And we have a solution to the 340 cipher. We've been working pretty hard, and we got something huge here. Craig's solution is the best thing out there. It's the best thing that's ever been proposed. But the fact is, there could be more clues hiding in the back of that cipher. I don't think it's gibberish, and I think the Zodiac killer's name is still in there. Cipher inside a cipher. Unbelievable. It pisses me off that Zodiac has never been caught, but I think it is absolutely possible for me and Sal to identify who the Zodiac killer is. Once you lose that fire in your belly, hit the street. We're moving forward, always moving forward. What we really need to do now is keep going. Explore the cipher within a cipher. Compare the Zodiac glove DNA to this new Riverside DNA. And of course, we keep pushing hard on our two primary suspects, Ross Sullivan and Lawrence Kane. I honestly couldn't begin to rule either of them out, which really begs the question, is the reason this case has remained unsolved? Is it because there's more than one Zodiac killer? The journey continues. You bet, partner.